Welcome once again to Hoosier History Legends and Heroes. In this episode we will take you on a journey, a journey back to the Civil War. The Civil War began on April 12, 1861 and ended on May 9, 1865. Robert E. Lee was the Confederate General of the Army of Northern Virginia. He was a top graduate of the U.S. Military Academy and had been an outstanding officer in the U.S. Army for 32 years. He had served as superintendent for the U.S. Military Academy. George B. McClellan was the Union General of the Potomac. He was a graduate of West Point. He was known for his organizational skills. He was also known for being extremely cautious, maybe too cautious. We want to tell you how in September of 1862, these two generals with their armies came face to face at the Battle of Antietam. The Battle of Antietam, also known as the Battle of Sharpsburg, was the bloodiest day in American history, with a combined total of 22,717 dead, wounded, or missing. We will tell you how Indiana had a hand in the history of this day. Plus, we will also tell you about an unsolved mystery in the Civil War. In September of 1862, General Robert E. Lee wanted to begin his Maryland campaign. Lee wanted to move onto northern soil in the state of Maryland. He wanted to enter Maryland and move into Washington, D.C. and up to Pennsylvania. He was thinking when the civilians in the north, after witnessing the death, destruction, and horror of war, would want the war to end. And if the war ended, the South could finally become its own nation. General Lee issued Special Order 191 on September 9, 1862. Copies were made for his commanding officers. In Special Order 191, he ordered that his army would be divided into four columns. Three columns would head towards Harper's Ferry, taking the three mountains that surrounded the town. The fourth column would move to Boonesboro, 15 miles north of Harper's Ferry and wait until the three other columns had succeeded at Harper's Ferry and would return to reunite Lee's army. 26,000 men led by General Stonewall Jackson began the march towards Harper's Ferry on September 10th. The 27th Indiana Volunteer Infantry was organized in Indianapolis on September 12, 1861, under the command of Colonel Silas Colgrove, the men gathered at the State Fairgrounds of Indianapolis that was then known as Camp Morton. Camp Morton was named after the governor of Indiana, Oliver P. Morton. They made their way to an open common area on the banks of White River just above the Terre Haute and Indianapolis Railroad. This became their temporary camp. The 27th Indiana Infantry left for Washington, D.C. on September 15, 1861. A year later, on September 13, 1862, the 27th Indiana finds itself at Frederick, Maryland. Just after arriving, they stacked the rifles on the same ground that had been occupied by Confederate General D.H. Hill's men the evening before. After stacking the rifles, the soldiers took a rest because they had been marching since earlier that morning. Private Barton Mitchell noticed something on the ground. He finds three cigars wrapped in a piece of paper. He shares his findings of the paper and cigars with Sergeant John Bloss. After reading the paper, they knew it was something that needed to get to General McClellan immediately. Mitchell and Bloss went straight to their commanding officer, Colonel Colgrove. What they had found changed the course of American history. The paper that was wrapped around the cigars 
was General D. H. Hill's copy of Robert E. Lee's Special Order 191. The following is taken from the recollections of Colonel Colgrove about that day in 1862 for an article that was published in Century Magazine. Colgrove states that they had arrived about noon on the 13th of September at Frederick, Maryland. He continues saying that his men had stacked arms on the same ground that had been occupied by Confederate General D. H. Hill's men the evening before. Within minutes of stopping at Frederick, General Lee's Special Order 191 was brought to his attention by First Sergeant John M. Bloss and Private B. W. Mitchell of Company F, 27th Indiana Volunteers, who stated that it was found by Private Mitchell near where they had stacked their arms. When he received the order, it was wrapped around three cigars, and Private Mitchell stated that it was in that condition when found by him. Realizing what he held in his hands, Colonel Colgrove took it to his commanding officer's headquarters, where it was delivered to Colonel S. E. Pittman. What was found was a copy of Lee's special order signed by Colonel Chilton, who was General Lee's adjutant general. Fate would have it that the Union Army's Colonel Pittman knew the Confederate Colonel Chilton and recognized his signature, proving the authenticity of the order. Colonel Pittman immediately took Lee's order to General McClellan. Just think, the Union Army is now holding in its hands the orders given by General Robert E. Lee to his commanding officers. The orders tell him the exact movements of Lee's entire army, stating where each unit will be going and what they were to accomplish. If the orders had not been dropped and found by Private Mitchell and Sergeant Bloss, Antietam may never have happened. That was a battle that neither Lee or McClellan on that morning had any idea was going to be happening in just a few days' time. General McClellan was noted as saying, Now I know what to do. Here is a paper with which, if I cannot whip Bobby Lee, I will be willing to go home. After reading Lee's special order 191, McClellan moves his army towards Lee's divided army. On September 14, 1862, was the Battle of South Mountain. General McClellan needed the access of three South Mountain passes to pursue Lee's army. Through intelligence sources, Lee finds out that somehow McClellan has gotten a copy of his order. Lee is trying to get his separated army back together again. By the end of the day, Lee ordered his men to withdraw and Lee even considered ending his Maryland campaign. The success for McClellan's army at South Mountain was a morale booster to the Union soldiers after previously de suffering defeats. On September 15th, General McClellan doesn't go full force after General Lee. This gives time for the men under Stonewall Jackson who had started the attack on Harper's Ferry on the 12th to capture the Union garrison that was stationed at Harper's Ferry on the 15th. This also gives time for Lee's scattered army to unite at Sharpsburg, Maryland by Antietam Creek. McClellan wrongly believed that Lee's army was larger than his. Maybe this was the reason that no attack happened on the 16th of September when Lee was uniting his army and was on the defensive. The Battle of Antietam started early on the morning of the 17th. There were three phases to Antietam. The morning phase ended up with a major fighting in a 24-acre cornfield. The 27th Indiana Infantry was in this battle. The morning phase ended up with nearly 13,000 casualties on both sides. The midday phase will become known as the Bloody Lane. It happened at a sunken road which formed a trench-like defensive position for the Confederate soldiers. At first, the Confederate troops shot down row after row of Union soldiers. The Union Army was finally able to attack from both sides of the road. In what had been a defensive position, 
has now became a death trap to the Confederate soldiers. The afternoon phase, now known as Burnside's Bridge, was at the southern end of the battlefield. General Ambrose Burnside was to cross Rohrbach's Bridge over Antietam Creek. It took three attempts to cross what is now called Burnside's Bridge with heavy casualties. Burnside was heading toward Sharpsburg and was close to trapping Lee's army against the Potomac River when Confederate General A.P. Hill arrived from Harper's Ferry and was able to stop Burnside. The Battle of Antietam was now over. On the morning of September 18th, Lee's army was ready to defend against an attack by McClellan that never came. Once again, McClellan's caution may have cost him from capturing Lee and possibly ending the war. Because of the inaction of McClellan, Lee was able to move his army across the Potomac and back into Virginia. The Union had suffered 12,410 casualties with 2,108 dead soldiers, with the Confederates suffering 10,316 casualties with 1,546 dead soldiers. There was no obvious winner of this battle, but with Lee retreating first, it can be considered a victory for the North. President Lincoln was not happy with General McClellan. Because of him being overly cautious and believing that Lee had more soldiers than he did, he lost the few opportunities that had presented themselves to capture General Lee. President Lincoln could not believe that after Antietam till October 26, after repeated orders from the War Department and Lincoln himself to cross the Potomac and pursue General Lee and his army, General McClellan gave excuses why he could not. On November 5th, President Lincoln relieved McClellan from his command of the Army of the Potomac, sending him home. President Lincoln replaced General McClellan with General Ambrose Burnside. The Aftermath On September 22nd, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Antietam was the bloodiest day in U.S. history with a combined total of 22,717 dead, wounded or missing. The mystery of how Lee's Special Order 191 was left on the ground to be found by Barton Mitchell and John Bloss. The order is now known as the Lost Order or the Lost Dispatch. This is a mystery that will never be solved. There are plenty of theories, but the last Confederate soldier to have possession of it went to his grave with this knowledge. General George McClellan ran against Abraham Lincoln for the presidency in 1864. We all know that Lincoln was re-elected. John Bloss was wounded at Antietam. He also was wounded in several other battles of the Civil War. Suffering from ill health caused by fever and wounds, then a lieutenant he resigned from the Army on October 17, 1864. He returned to Indiana and became a highly respected educator. He died April 26, 1905, and is buried in Muncie, Delaware County, Indiana. Barton Mitchell was severely wounded at Antietam. He spent the next eight months recovering in the hospital. Afterwards, he returned to his regiment and finished out his three years of service. He returned to Indiana, where he died at the age of 51 on January 29, 1868. He is buried in Hartsville, Bartholomew County, Indiana. This plaque stands in the town square of Hartsville in remembrance of Barton Mitchell in the role he played in Lee's Lost Order. In an article in the Fayetteville Semi-Weekly Observer, General D.H. Hill has learned that there was an article written blaming him for losing Lee's order, and this was the reason Lee's Maryland campaign was a failure. 
Because the order was addressed to General D.H. Hill, obviously a lot of people blamed him for carelessly dropping it. In his defense, he has the original order that he had received. The original orders that he had received came directly from Stonewall Jackson, written in Jackson's own hand. Hill was not expecting to receive orders directly from General Lee. He suggests others may have lost it before it was even delivered to him. The 27th Indiana Infantry was the tallest regiment in the Civil War, being nicknamed the Giants by enemy citizens and soldiers. Company F of the 27th, which Mitchell and Bloss were included, had the tallest soldier in the war. He was Captain David Van Buskirk from Bloomington, Indiana. This article from the Pittsburgh Daily Post on September 12, 1863, starts off with a tall soldier David Van Buskirk is the tallest man in the Army of the Potomac. He is 6 feet 11 inches in his stockings and weighs 250 pounds. It talks about how he and other tall men of his regiment were taken prisoner and they had created quite a sensation among the rebels who were surprised to learn that the Northwestern states produced such men. I will admit this is the first time I have ever heard that Indiana was considered a Northwestern state. Standing at that great height, you would think Van Buskirk would be an easy target, but he was never wounded in the war. As per the Muncie Evening Press in 1905, Company F of the Indiana 27th Infantry was known as the Tall Boys because every member was six feet or more in height. There was a book written about the 27th Indiana titled Giants in the Cornfield. The 27th also fought in the Battle of Chancellorsville and the Battle of Gettysburg. There are monuments at all three of these battlegrounds remembering the soldiers of the 27th. The 27th Indiana, which began in September 1861, was mustered out on November 4, 1864. The soldiers were transferred to the 70th Indiana Infantry. This is the monument at Antietam. The plaque tells that the 27th Indiana Infantry under Colonel Silas Colgrove was engaged with the enemy 400 yards north of this marker on September 17, 1862. Number of soldiers engaged, 440. Number killed and wounded, 209. The monument at Chancellorsville held this position from 7 p.m. May 2nd to 9 a.m. May 3rd, 1863. Present for duty were 300, killed were 36, with 114 wounded. The monument at Gettysburg states that the 27th Indiana Infantry made a charge on the morning of July 3rd, 1863. The number of engaged soldiers were 339. The number killed and wounded were 110. One soldier was missing. Thank you for watching, and we hope you enjoyed this video telling how two soldiers from Indiana changed the course of the Civil War and are part of one of the greatest Civil War unsolved mysteries. Until next, next time. time.